Without further ado, I'd like to hand things over and welcome Dr. Cheryl Thompson. Cheryl, thank you for being here. No, thank you so much, Daniel, for that introduction. That was amazing. So I'm going to share my screen because there is a slide presentation. And in doing that, actually, before I do that, sorry, I'm going to reshare it again. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I've never been to Germany, but here's a good window of opportunity for me to actually physically at some point come to Germany. So here's what the talk is going to be about. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm essentially going to take the viewers who are here through um, a history of Black beauty culture over the last, it's not just one century, it's many centuries. Um, we're going to talk about beauty culture in North America to begin, like, because that's what I know more, right, in the present. But in the point three, when I talk about the industry and things that need to be attuned to, that's kind of going to speak to a, the global industry. And then the second point, the politics of Black hair in particular over the last century. One of the things in giving this talk that I was really mindful of is that not everybody knows not everybody knows what black hair is, like why it's an issue, um, sort of some of the things that have happened over the last century that have affected black women's lives. And it doesn't matter if you live in North South America, if you live in the Caribbean, if you live in Europe, if you live in continent, continental Africa and beyond. One of the things that black women all have in common is that we all have the same or around the same hair texture. And we've probably experienced some of the same things. It doesn't even matter if we don't speak the same language. So we have that shared experience. And one of the reasons we have that shared experience, you know, at like anything else, when it comes to Black history, you really have to go back to Africa, West African nations to be specific. So that is actually where I'm going to start this discussion, because you can't really understand sort of where we are today without understanding where we started and sort of all the diversity. I'm showing you an up close shot here of what they consider to be West Africa. You think about all of these countries that you see on the screen today. And today you can probably have an understanding of how different they are, that they actually all also speak a different language and they have different ethnic ethno culturals, cultures in their countries. Now imagine what happens during transatlantic slavery, which is where we have to start. And so if we go back to those countries, I'm showing you an image here of a graphic of black hairstyles that would have existed in Africa. What are you seeing? You're seeing a lot of different um, textures and braids and, and each one actually signaled something different. And so I'm showing you here on the screen, you can see all the different tribes, ethnic groups that lived in different regions in West Africa. They were not all living in the same region. And because they lived in different regions, they were different ethnicities, they wore their hair differently. And in wearing their hair differently, hair signaled different things. Whether you were single, you were married, you were in mourning, you were a person of nobility living in the community, uh, you worked a certain occupation, everything had a meeting. And at the same time, if you can imagine going back to this time, so this is pre-transatlantic um, slavery, and even after, because as we know, not everybody was taken onto a slave ship, what you have in African communities is the knowledge of how to care for your hair. People are given that title of hairdresser or hair carer. So somebody, if you look at this image I'm showing you, somebody did this. <laughs> somebody and probably many people did this. They had the trained skill to do it. But what happens through enslavement, and I love, I don't love, but showing this image helps people to really visually understand that when people mention the middle passage, that term, what they're actually talking about is the sort of what they call the horn of West Africa, the sort of the, 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 West, the Eastern tips of South America, 
the Caribbean and then the west, the eastern coastline of North America, that space in between is known as the Middle Passage. And so it's in the Middle Passage that everything I just said to you becomes homogenized into one African body. All, any linguistic difference, ethnic difference was suddenly just erased. And so if you think about being on the slave ship, you would have had all of these people who in West Africa were very different. They did not speak the same languages. They were not culturally the same. They didn't even wear their hair the same, yet they were on a ship for months on end. And then when they um, got off the ship and were in this new world, suddenly they had to learn how to live together because they were deemed to be the same. So they got categorized as the same. And all those differences, they didn't really mean much. However, while I always start with this story, it, there's kind of a victory in this story too, because even through the middle passage, everything I just said to you, we didn't fully lose it. For some reason, it lingered on and it stayed on through the storytelling that people would have been saying. Generation after generation, they were sharing the stories passed down from their ancestors of how they cared their hair. But when you think about this, I'm sure some of you here either have an Afro pig or you've seen it or you've heard of it. I mean, this is essentially the tool, the instrument that was used to care for black hair. So if you were an enslaved African now on a plantation in South America, the Caribbean or North America, one, you didn't have time for those elaborate hairstyles anymore. There was no time for that. And you also probably didn't have access to this. You did not have an Afro pick. And as a result, black women and men's hair was often unkept damaged or, or it was covered under a head wrap. And so what happens then is that if you're hiding your hair, if your hair is becoming damaged, and also an important part of this story is that you can think of the diet of an enslaved person, probably not very good. So a lot of enslaved people had vitamin deficiencies. So some of the hair loss wasn't just because they couldn't care their hair, it's because they lacked the nutrients in their diet. Like what they were actually eating was very poor and so their hair was falling out. And so why this matters is because, you know, even in the contemporary, one of the reasons why black women in particular were so often focused on our hair is because we understand and have a sense of this lineage that the black body in history was often judged as being a sick body because of the state of the hair. But that judgment was often because there was a lack of understanding that we did not have the tools that we had back in Africa. We did not have the community that we had that had that community knowledge of how to care our hair. And we also did not have the time to care our hair. And so what happens in sites, of, sites that have a history of slavery also have a history of head wrapping because the head wrapping then takes on new significance. And I'm showing you a book cover here from Kay Diane Kriz, who writes about slavery, sugar, and the culture of refinement in the Caribbean, and does a lot of writing about head wrapping itself. That what happens through this middle passage and into the new, new world is that now, for various reasons, Black women start covering their hair in different ways than they did back in Africa. The head wrapping of South America, of the Caribbean, of the Southern US in particular, is a very different type of head wrapping. And often it was related to the fabric that they could get in the site, but also the fact that, like I said, didn't have time to care their hair, hair might have been falling out or in just ill and a bad state, or sometimes the head wrapping beca began to take on other kinds of symbolic meaning. So if any of you are familiar with the, the, the state of New Orleans, for example, of Louisiana, I should say. In Louisiana, head wrapping was taking on a lot of significance because you had sort of a race, um, um, sort of a multi-tiered society 
where you had enslaved people, free people, and sort of what became known as a Creole class of people who were more today, we would consider them biracial, but they took up this middle space. They loved to wear head wrapping because it signaled sort of, again, your position in the community. So you have, by the time we're getting, by now I'm really talking into the 19th century. You still have all the legacy of slavery, all the stuff that I was talking about, but you're getting to a point now where Black women as a collective are wanting to do more than just cover their hair all day, right? There has to be something else that they do. And at the same time in the popular culture, we have this. If you read my book, Uncle, I talk a lot about Uncle Tom's Cabin, the 1952 um, abolitionist text by Harriet Beecher Stowe. But what I also do is that I talk about the commodity stereotype that get born in the United States in the late in the 19th century into the 20th century. And you can see Aunt Jemima, formerly known as Aunt Jemima, Aunt Jemima products have since changed their name. Aunt Jemima was sort of the symbol for this depiction of an enslaved Black woman wearing a head wrap. That image in that was very ubiquitous throughout the 20th century. In 1939, there was actually a Hollywood film that some of you might have seen called Gone with the Wind, where the role of Mammy was played by an African-American woman, Hattie McDaniel, who also wore a head wrap in that, in, in that movie, because that became sort of the, 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 the dress of the enslaved woman working in the house. However, understand that that's a Hollywood fiction because head wrapping, as I was saying to you, was ubiquitous with throughout slave societies. It wasn't just resigned to the, the, the sort of plump, overweight, dark-skinned Black woman who was serving in the house. And so because the, the imagery of head wrapping has been so taken over by consumer culture, a lot of people have a negative association with wrapping their hair because they don't want to look like a mammy or they don't want to look like Aunt Jemima. Meanwhile, the truth is there's a rich history of head wrapping that predates <laughs> commodity culture that really should be cherished because um, that was one of the ways in which Black women sort of resisted the, the state of enslavement and had some ability to self-express, even though they were held in a system of bondage. And so that leads us to cornrows. Thinking about cornrows, I'm sure many of you have seen these hairstyles and did not know that often people would corn roll or in corn row or in the Caribbean, they call it cane row their hair in the same map as the plantation grounds. So that the style of the braid would literally be the map that people would use to run for freedom. And so just so you know, why did they call them cane row? Well, in the, in the, in the Caribbean um, slave societies, the crop was sugar cane. So you were literally looking for the cane rows. In the United States, the crop was not sugar cane. Although we do talk a lot about cotton, cotton plantations in the Southern United States, the truth is there are some corn fields that had to go through too. <laughs> so the corn row and the cane row are a naming that really do come from transatlantic slavery, even though the, the practice of this type of braiding, again, goes back to Africa. But the naming of the braiding happens on plantations when enslaved Africans realized we could use our hair to, to enact our own freedom. And if you think about how powerful that is to have that realization that because black hair um, has a certain texture, a coiled texture that can be braided in ways that say non people of non-African descent, it's very hard to braid your hair in a way that's going to keep. But people of African descent, we can do a lot of elaborate braiding with our hair. And so they realized over time that they can use the one thing they have that sets them apart to seek their freedom. And I love to say it that way because it, it helps to remap 
the negative association that a lot of people have with this particular hairstyle. In the United States, in particular, for example, you can be sent home from school if you wear your hair in this hairstyle. I'm not sure what the cases are in Europe, but in North America, this style is often punished. <laughs> it is not rewarded. And so if you know the roots history that I'm giving you here, the real question to ask yourself, well, why are we still punishing people of African descent for wearing a hairstyle that is actually symbolic of their freedom? Because that's what cornrows actually are. And then there's this person. This is an, an ad. We're going to get into the specifics of it, of Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was the first person in her family to be born out of slavery. So she was never enslaved. But given that her family lineage was people who were enslaved, Sarah Breedlove, which was her born name, um, always was an you know, working below the poverty line. She worked as a laundress. She, you know, herself had hair loss and problems growing her hair. And so she's really the inspiration for many people because she used that hard knock story to create her own beauty product line in the early 20th century. For those who Netflix, <laughs> Netflix actually has a four part series about Madam CJ Walker called Self Made. But on the left is the actual Madam C.J. Walker, who many people say changed the beauty culture industry, not just for Black women, but writ large, because not only was she the first woman millionaire that we know of, documented, she also created a system of hair care that included giving Black women jobs. So her system was the Walker system also known as the shampoo press and curl. So the hot comb that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, Madam C.J. Walker didn't invent the hot comb, but she repurposed it for coiled hair. Now, at the time that Madam C.J. Walker is, is launching her business, so we're talking about late 19th century, the first decades of the 20th century, you know, she's also facing some criticism. Based on what I just spent the last I don't know, what is it, 20 minutes talking about. She was criticized for basically creating a product that said to Black women that beauty is only going to be attained when you straighten your hair. So many people felt that she was disparagingly putting down the cornrow, the braids, all those African hairstyles that I talked about before. But what I think is really healthy to do is to put Madam C.J. Walker into context. And she even said this at the time. What she was trying to do is give Black women a sense of beauty. A lot of Black women at this time suffered from damaged hair. Hair was falling out, big bald patches everywhere. And you can imagine for a woman, you know, your self-esteem would just be so tattered at that point that all you could do every day was wrap your hair. So then wrapping the hair was not because you loved head, hair wrapping. It was because you actually wanted to hide yourself because of the damaged state of your hair. So Madam CJ Walker comes along and she not only creates a product, yes, to help straighten the hair, but she creates a, a, a whole system to actually help heal your scalp. She had a glossine, she had a scalp healer, a shampoo, conditioner. There was all these products suddenly coming from a black woman whose story was tied to the product because she would tell the woman, the women that came to see her that she used to be them. Her hair used to look like, like, her, like theirs. And so she was living proof that her products worked and she became a millionaire. And so from Madam CJ Walker, we also have this, like sort of other stories that sort of got erased because Madam C.J. Walker made so much money. But the truth is this woman, Annie Turnbull Malone, was really the first Black woman to create a system that was known as pullers. So pullers were like a non-tech... Um, if we compare it to the hot comb that I'm going to show you next, pullers were um, something that you did to just basically pull the hair to straighten it, <laughs> okay? And the reason pullers 
didn't really take off is because while you're pulling the hair to straighten it, you were potentially also pulling out your own hair. So pullers were actually eventually like people just did not use them because they were very dangerous. But both Annie Turnbow Malone and Madam C.J. Walker actually borrowed some of their methods from the California perfume company, which later became known as Avon, which many of you might have heard of that was founded in 1886. So they didn't start from scratch. They looked around them and they said, oh, OK, these techniques seem to be working in white communities. Why don't we just use the same techniques in black communities? So the door to door pyramid type selling strategy was that you hired one black woman to sell the product and then she herself would almost become a franchise onto herself. And then she would hire two others and then four others and then eight others and then so on and so on. And then they would go around the South to black communities and they would sell the products. And of course it was a hit. And so here's another example I'm giving you of the shampoo press and curl method because many people sometimes don't actually know what that is. I'm sure you might've heard of a hot comb. Here's an example of what a hot comb is. It's literally tongs, today we would call them tongs that get heated up in a cylinder or just on a regular hot on a regular stove, a gas stove, or even electric stove can do it too. And then the hair is taken and pulled through the hot comb. Again, Marcel Gratteau, who's a French hairdresser in 1872, actually invented this instrument that was available at department stores like Sears and Bloomingdale's in the 1890s. So Madame Malone and Walker, also borrowed this technique too and said, okay, well, you know, this type of metal hair instrument actually exists, but why don't we modify it so that it will work on black women's hair? Because our hair texture is thicker. You really have to be a lot more, um, you could be a little bit more aggressive with the hot comb because we have a thicker texture, but you still have to be careful because you, you can still burn somebody's scalp. And so Madam Walker, like Malone and so many others, were teaching Black women how to care for their hair because they had spent centuries covering it up, leaving it unkept, and not knowing what to do. So I'm starting with this early sense of the business part of it because it's really important to, to not, on, not just look at the fact that they were conditioning Black women to straighten their hair like so they could look like white women. No. They were helping Black women get back in touch with their hair so that they can be in control of what their hair actually looks like. And so by the time we get into the 1950s, I'm showing you here um, images from Ebony Magazine. That is the first sort of middle class African American magazine founded in 1945 by John H. Johnson. Then you have John H. Johnson, John and Eunice, his wife, Johnson also founded the Ebony Fashion Fair, in, also in Chicago in 1958. So Ebony Fashion Fair was a traveling fashion show that featured black models. One of the first, if not the first in the world to have an all black models sort of travel around um, the US. I'm not sure if they went to Europe. Uh, I don't believe they came to Canada. I'm not too certain on that either, um, but it was during the Ebony Fashion Fair um, fashion shows where Eunice would look around and notice that models, black models, couldn't find cosmetics to match their skin. So they were matching, they were mixing various cosmetics together. And often their skin was looking very cakey and it just, you know, it, nothing fit their skin tone. And they realized that there was a gap in the industry, that Black women were actually not just being underserved in terms of our hair, but in terms of cosmetics, there were no cosmetics that actually were being made to suit darker pigment. There just wasn't. And so they said, you know, again, the entrepreneurial spirit of many African Americans said, we, need, we should do something about this. And so that sort of led to a whole series of work that gets done in the 50s and 60s that actually makes it possible for suddenly all these Black women to end up on the cover of magazines. And all of this happens in the 1960s 
never happened before that you had black women on the cover of major fashion magazines and life magazine. And so because you had all these black women suddenly showing up in, in, in sort of the, the dominant women's magazines and fashion magazines of the era, there was this real sense that the industry was changing. And believe me, this is even before my lifetime. And people thought the industry was changing because suddenly you had black women who were wearing their hair, some natural, some straightened, some in a quasi African kind of ode um, in terms of this Naomi Sims cover from Life magazine, which I still love so much, by the way. I actually think this is probably one of the best covers in the history of covers. Um, but this was a real sense that things were changing. And then you have this, the 1968 Miss America protest. Many of you might remember this because this is the moment where they said women were on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey, burning bras. You've ever heard like the burning bra feminist? That stereotype comes from the top image where they, women, second wave feminists kind of made themselves known at the 1968 Miss America pageant where they essentially were protesting the beauty pageant. They said the beauty pageant is sexist, it's patriarchal. What most people don't realize that is that down the street, the Miss Black America pageant was simply trying to claim that Black women were beautiful, <laughs> that, they, that they existed in the realm of beauty. Because it was not until, as you see, 1970, that Miss America was actually open to non-white contestants. Before 1970, Miss America was a white only pageant. And people might say, well, why do pageants matter? I'm gonna talk about pageants in a little bit because pageants came back into the, into the discussion in 2019. And I think the way the pageants came back into the discussion is very interesting because just a few weeks ago, we got the tail end of that pageant of all this pageantry about black women finally winning crowns, I would say to you is that while beauty pageants matter, it's actually about the system of support that's in place for when black women sort of get these crowns of beauty. And that's where we're still not at in the 21st century. But what's key here, I wanna show a little short video. I know we talked about this video, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully it'll play and there won't be any sound issues. I'm showing you this video because it kind of, this is Vanessa Williams, if you don't know. Vanessa Williams is an African-American actress, singer, performer, and also the first black woman to be crowned Miss America. And I'm showing this little short clip because she talks about what that experience was like, but also kind of taps in to the sort of the intersections of beauty culture that's not just about hair, it's also about skin. And it's also about ideas of purity, which Black women are often presumed not to have. And so Vanessa Williams is just going to share a little bit of her experience. What happened was one particular summer, I was working for a um, photographer and he said, listen, you know, you're beautiful. Do you mind if I do some photos of you? No one will see them. I agree. Then, you know what? Uh, I've got a friend. Can she come over? I'd like to do some black and white shots in, in silhouette. No one will see you. Fine, fine. And again, after I've worked there and, and feel quite comfortable and trust that no one's ever going to see these photos. The following year, I win Miss America. Uh, meanwhile, after I win Miss America, this photographer, he ended up going from magazine to magazine. He went to, to Playboy. Playboy said they wouldn't really, uh, buy them, these photos. And he ended up going to Penthouse, and Penthouse said, sure, we'll do it. And ended up publishing them with six weeks left in my reign. My biggest, probably, fear um, was to tell my parents because you don't want to disappoint your parents. 
once I knew that it was a reality and I called them into the my hotel room and uh, they said, okay, we love you. I knew that they were in my corner. I knew that they support me and I knew that we'd get through it. Miss America, Vanessa Williams took off her clothes and now she's being asked to give up her crown within 72 hours. That announcement today by Miss America pageant officials in Atlantic City. Williams may be dethroned because of some nude pictures of her with another woman taken before she was crowned Miss America. So I ended up having a press conference, resigning. I wish I could retain my title as Miss America. However, the potential harm to the pageant and the deep division that a bitter fight may cause has convinced me that I must relinquish my title as Miss America. Not only was that something that has never happened within the pageant organization, uh, it was this huge dichotomy, uh, and it couldn't be any more uh, polar opposite of two images. You've, you've got Miss America, who is uh, angelic, and you've got uh, naked pictures, which is salacious. So I ended up going into a lawsuit against Penthouse Magazine. And while you're, you know, you have to do a deposition and your, your, your lawyers are talking to you about the trial, this might come up. I'm just going to stop it there because the rest isn't really germane to what I'm going to talk about. But why I showed you that clip is because Vanessa Williams was the first Black Miss America. And Vanessa Williams is also one of the lightest skinned Black Miss Americas. And yet she was still treated as if she was different to all the other women who had ever been Miss America. And the reason that is, is because in the context of beauty, it, there's still a sense of all it takes is one drop of otherness still sets you apart from the dominant beauty standard. That's really what Vanessa Williams Come up and he said sort of saying in that clip and what I wanted to, to kind of pivot as we talk about black hair over the last century, because she was the perfect example of someone who checked every box. She's beautiful. She has light skin. Her hair actually was like naturally straight. She has checked every box and yet she was still othered in a kind of way where she almost, she still couldn't fully um, be absorbed into the dominant beauty standard that also comes with sort of narratives of purity, and respectability and all of that. She had to be stained in some way through what happened with those photographs that she took before holding the crown. If we now go back, let's forget that's 1984, whenever that was. The 1960s really did shift the image of black women. It shifted the image of hair. If you see here on the top right, at Cicely Tyson, who passed away a few years ago in 1963-4, she was in a show where she wore an African-inspired braided hairdo, like you see here in this cover. Beside her, Angela Davis, who I'm sure everyone is familiar with, activist, militant, has been wearing an Afro since 1969. <laughs> these women, these hairstyles suddenly became the badge to wear if you were black. So the Black is Beautiful movement was attached to these, this, these like iconic images from the 1960s. And so suddenly your collective identity became more important than your individual identity. And why that matters is most people don't remember this, but when Vanessa Williams was crowned Miss America in 1984, a lot of black community were actually angry because they thought she was white identified. They didn't really claim her as black Miss America because of how she looked. Because in the consciousness, this is black. Black looks like this. And so that's what happened in the 1960s. We often talk about the 1960s and the civil rights movement in the United States. We don't re remember the fact that it wasn't just civil rights in terms of legislative change and desegregating schools and, and public facilities. It was also civil rights to reclaim one's ancestral attachment to Africa. So there was a reclaiming of Africa as, as one's homeland, but also aesthetically, as being the signifiers of 
the race. So to be black was to reclaim Africa as your identity. And so here's an example I'm trying to give you from the shift. We look on the left, on the, on the left, here's what they were selling in terms of advertising imagery in the 1950s. By the 1970s, the same company is now selling you Afrosheen and is now giving you a very different vision of black beauty that is very different than the vision that was being sold in the 1950s. And that vision has a lot to do with, again, the social cultural movements of the 60s. That was the legacy of the 1970s that still lingered when Vanessa Williams was crowned. It was still in the ether. Why she also was really ostracized by her own community too. And here's just another sense too of fashion fair cosmetics. So by the 1970s, you have a line of cosmetics geared toward black women. I'm just giving you a sampling of advertisements from that time. And you can see they're very Afrocentric. Women have a natural Afro. They're sort of dressed in the sort of colors and tones that are very different than you would have seen say in the forties and fifties. And so again, Eunice and John Johnson, they, tried to approach mainstream companies to create products for Black women, and they were turned down. So they went in and they did it themselves. So Fashion Fair Cosmetics is actually the first cosmetics that was sold at department stores geared towards Black women. And one of the reasons why um, the Johnsons were able to get their products into the department stores was because they had already proven success with the Ebony Fashion Fair and, of course, Ebony Magazine. So think about that. John and Johnson and Eunice Johnson had to create an empire <laughs> before they could get their products into the department store in the 1970s. And I think understanding those structural constraints really helps to put them in context and say how amazing these people were, not just as business people, but visionaries, because they would not accept no for an answer. They just wouldn't. When the mainstream said no and turned them down, they just went out and did it themselves. And I think that's a good message that, that we need to be telling, especially young Black people today, when they we're still in an environment where we're being told no, then just go out and do it yourself. A no is not a no, it's a detour to take another road to get to the same result. And so the Johnsons, they did that in the 60s and 70s. Then 1975 happened. And 1975 is a very pivotal year because that was the year where in the United States, the FTC Commission, um, the Federal Trade Commission forced Johnson products. So the same Johnson products, the Ultra Sheen, and they, by then they'd also had a chemical relaxer product that they were selling. They forced them to sign a consent degree that basically acknowledged that there were safety problems with their Ultra Sheen Permanent Cream Relaxer. A relaxer is a, is a chemical hair straightening product. So they were forced to sign this. White companies were not forced to sign it. So between 1975 and 1998, essentially white owned companies took over the black beauty culture industry because of this FTC ruling that set Johnson Products, which was the number one company in Black beauty in 1975, it basically set them aside because now the public believed that their products were harmful because they had to affix a, a warning label that the other companies didn't have to put on their products till like five or six years later. By then the damage had been done. In 98, L'Oreal, buys Soft Sheen, which was an African-American owned company. By 2000, L'Oreal then buys Carson Products, another African-American owned company. They then create the Soft Sheen Carson division, which sells all these products that you see here, all of them geared towards black women. Um, all of them are chemically based products. 2010, Unilever, um, the Dutch, um, mega corporation buys Alberta, Alberto Culver, um, which had bought out a bunch of African-American companies in the, in the 2000s. 
And all of these products you see here are also chemical relaxers and sort of shampoos and conditioners. Then in 2014, L'Oreal also then bought Carol's Daughter. Carol's Daughter was formerly a natural hair care product line out of Brooklyn, New York. It filed for bankruptcy, L'Oreal came in and bought it. So in this nice little timeline that I've given you here, what I'm essentially saying to you is, today, the black beauty culture industry is essentially dominated by L'Oreal, Unilever, I think Procter and Gamble is another company. Those are the top three. The black beauty culture industry of the 21st century is actually not owned by black people. It's owned by white companies that have black facing labels. And I think this mergers and acquisitions line is really important to the conversation because it helps to kind of explain why you walk into a store and this is what you see. At a typical black beauty uh, product shop, you're gonna see hair weaves, you're gonna see chemical relaxers. This is a, these are images I took right here in Toronto. And you know, I am not one of those people who's being critical of the sole proprietor who has a hair shop. It's a very tough business. And you also have to feed your clientele what your customers are interested in. What I'm really saying is the who owns the industry determines what's popular and you know, really determines, sort of, sort of feeds the engine, so to speak, on people's purchasing choices. And if one of the things to understand about this topic is that the Black beauty culture industry, which includes skin and hair, is what we would consider to be a recession-proof industry, meaning it is, its sales are not dependent on market fluctuations. So if the dollar goes up or down, if the economy is in a slump, Black beauty culture industry sales only go up. They never go down. Only in the last few years have chemical relaxer sales started to dip but it's still a very marginal dip. It's not a huge spike. And what that means is, is that you have a product dependent um, segment of the population that needs to buy products. And if they need to buy products, it means it really doesn't matter what you sell them, they're always gonna buy it. And so one of the aims of the work that I've been trying to do is to just raise people's consciousness to say, you know, you actually don't need to buy the product that's being sold to you. Instead, you can ask yourself what is good for you and, and what is going to feed your hair and your soul other than what's being sold to you. Because one of the dirty secrets of the hair trade is that it's big money. This is an old article from 2012. And look at the revenues from 2012. This is in pounds, 38 million pounds worth of hair imported into the UK, the third biggest importer of human hair in the world. We're talking, we're not talking about a small, people often think black hair is a frivolous topic. It actually isn't. We're talking about big millions, if not billions of dollars. And here you have this quote here, despite the, U the recession in, this is around 2012, um, the hair extension industry was booming with hair extension companies claiming it is worth between 45 million and 60 million pounds. I mean, just think about those monies, those numbers. And that was 10 years ago. It's probably double that today. But one of the main things to think about when it comes to hair, and I'm showing you Chris Rock's 2009 film, Good Hair, is that the dirty secret behind it, though, is that, you know, where it comes from, you know, a lot of this hair is coming from the poorest countries in the world. And so you have sort of the dark side of the industry is that that's who's picking the hair. You know, it's people who are coming from very poor villages in India and China um, and other places. And then in Europe is actually where you have a lot of the the sort of the salespeople or the importers, the importer exporter of hair, they tend to live in Europe, whereas the hair is sourced in South Asia and Asian countries where there's ve where they're very poor. And then where is the market? 
Western Europe and North America. So you have this global network today of hair that is very disconnected from where we started this talk. Remember, we started this talk talking about transatlantic slavery. I would suggest to you all that in many ways, the contemporary global hair industry has reproduced a kind of transatlantic trade because those people who were the hair is sourced are essentially slave labor, essentially. And same idea, it's in an exchange with Europe and then it's sent through a new middle passage to North America. And it's kind of the dirty little secret that nobody really talks about because hair is just deemed a frivolous topic and people don't think it's big money. But what I'm trying to say here today is that it's very big money. There's a lot of people invested and a lot of the people behind the, the global beauty culture industry are actually men. It's actually not run by women, even though women are doing the work. And so this is something that I'm, I always try to bring awareness to when I give these talks that ask yourself the question, if you do consume hair, where does your hair come from? Just like we have started to ask the same question about consumer goods, we actually have to start asking the question about hair. And so how can the industry be more in tune with black history and culture? Just to wrap up in this last section. First of all, in 2008, Italian Vogue seemed to be making an attempt to rectify decades of erasure. Italian Vogue said, we're gonna come out with the black issue, right? And the whole issue was like all black models. And it sold out, I think, in the UK and the US in like 24 hours. That was 2008. It's really to my shock that here we are in the 21st century, 2022, and you have British Vogue doing this, essentially having a cover of their magazine where the, the skin tone of all the women is like a coal black that's not even a realistic skin tone, and they're all wearing European hairstyles, probably wigs. So again, if you think about where I started this talk about the, the sort of the hairstyles coming from Africa, the elaborate braiding, the meaning of the Afro pick, the meaning of the corn roll, and here we are in 2022, I'm just going to say to you, this is not progress. This is not where we need to be. This is still putting black beauty culture into a very like unhealthy box that actually says all black is the same. If you look at all these women's skin tones, they've been flattened so much, they're essentially the same. You could almost imagine it as the reenactment of the transatlantic slave ship where the African body was homogenized into the same. It's, it's just, it's a return to that homogenization that the likes of Madam C.J. Walker worked so hard a century ago to get us away from, right? To get us into a sort of an individuality that where you could see us for who we are. This isn't it. And so here we are on TV. Gabrielle Union was actually told that her hair was too black for America's Got Talent. This was in 2019. Too black. <laughs> I mean, who knows if that's the reason she was fired or why she left the show, but she did say that it was said to her that her hair was too black. Well, what does her hair, what did her hair look like on the show? Here are some images. And if you can see, Gabrielle Union was bringing back to life those same African hairstyles that I started this talk talking about. All she was doing was tapping into her African ancestry. And so when your African ancestry is too much for TV, I think the question that I'm really trying to get at in this talk is, you know, what is going on when Black people can't actually show up the way we want to show up? Because just as this white woman who is blonde can, can present herself in that way, I don't know why Gabrielle Union can't present herself in that way. That is the opposite way. Why we need to kind of homogenize, again, 
that difference and make everyone the same. It actually doesn't make any sense. But I think it speaks to where the beauty culture industry is. And just to return again to the pageants, if you recall, some of you might know this, in 2019, they, we were celebrating because there were five Black women who were crowned victory, um, victorious in beauty pageants, Miss World, um, Miss USA, Miss America, Miss Universe, Miss Teen USA, they were all Black. That was 2019. How shocked was I that one of those women just a few years later took her own life? Just a few, Miss USA took her own life. This was just like a month or so ago. And so the question I wanna leave with is really to think about all of these symbolic wins that we have celebrated over the last, I don't know, 50 or 60 years. The question is, is the infrastructure behind them changing? Meaning, are the, who runs Miss America? Is it, is it people of color running Miss America? Who are the support team behind these pageants? Is it a diverse support team? Like that's, I think, where we're at when it comes to beauty, to really step back and ask yourself, is this just the representation or is this actually about the ownership and the power? Because what I would suggest to you today is that the power of the industry really hasn't changed that much in ever. <laughs> the power behind the front stage is exactly as it was. And so really, what are the takeaways from this talk? I've tried to put a lot into such a short amount of time. One, Black cultural expressions are always intersectional. What that means is, is that we're not just dealing with, you know, it's not just about hair. It's also about skin. It's also about culture. It's also about ethnicity. Not all Black people are the same. I am a person who, I am citizenship Canadian, but my ancestry is from Jamaica, removed from Africa. That's me. There are people that I know who are Nigerian, who are African Canadian, multi generational Canadian. The way that we identify, it's totally different. That means the way we even, even the relationship we have with our hair is going to be different. So it's always kind of an important understanding to have that Blackness is intersectional and Black cultural expressions are also intersectional. There's no one shoe fits all. The next thing is, Black hair or Black beauty is always complicated by hair and skin. You actually can't separate the two. That was sort of what I was trying to get at in my presentation, that it's really difficult to just make it about hair or to just talk about skin. They, they, go, they overlap and they intersect. And then the final thing is, you know, the past and the present are always in conversation. That's the reason I could give those examples at the end there that are very contemporary, like they literally just happened, and they seem to be in conversation with the Middle Passage and the African pick and the head covering and the different ethnicities in West Africa. It's like we're still having the same conversation. <laughs> and so, you know, how do we improve how do we get beyond all of the things that I've been saying in this presentation? The truth is, it's hard for me to give an answer because we're still trying to address them. We actually haven't yet gotten to a point where the things that I've said in this presentation, everybody can agree on and everybody has an awareness of. So for me, the truth is the, the bright takeaway from this talk is to keep sharing the message until everybody takes the message as a given and common truth. And then we can look to move the conversation forward. And finally, just to be honest, just move on <laughs> from some of the things that I've talked about today that are clearly still in the ether, um, not just in North America, but globally. So I'm just gonna end it there. There's my contact, how you can reach me. I'm on Twitter, my email, YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, um, LinkedIn, my website, and... Um, my books. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.
Thank you so much. Um, I think we delivered on the promise of being both very interesting and also kind of depressing. Um, I just had to think about the conversation we had before the talk where we talked about electric cars and the, the quintessence was we didn't get very far. And whenever we thought about the future in the past, today is what we were talking about. And looking at it now, we've not come really far. And I feel like the same rings true for what you just talked about. I feel like the vocabulary may have changed, but as you said, the conversation is still the same. Um, so I hope there's a couple of things that we can take away that gives reason for hope. Um, but yeah, coming to a couple of questions, maybe the first one um, is a bit of a personal question, if you don't mind. Um, what made you decide to research in this field in the first place? Yes. Um, so so the book beauty in a box right that actually was my dissertation my phd dissertation and before i started that dissertation um not to age myself although i look you know you have no idea how old i am i could be anything um i in this i started my phd in 2009 so in 2007 i i had turned 30 and i remember when i had turned 20 it was just a random thing I, I, I said to myself. I said, when I turned 30, I was going to stop using a chemical relaxer. So that was just something I said. So I, I used a chemical relaxer since I was 14 years old. So at 30, I said, I am no longer putting this chemical in my hair. So that had been 16 years of using that chemical product. And if you don't know anything about um, chemical relaxers, you, you usually apply one every six to eight weeks. So every six to eight weeks, I put a harsh chemical in my hair for 16 years. So I had decided that I was done. So I, at 30, I decided that I also wanted to get locks or dreadlocks or dreads, however you describe them. And so when I went on that own, my own personal journey, I realized that at 30, I had never really touched my hair. <laughs> I'd never actually touched my physical hair because when you're a child, as a black girl, somebody does your hair. You don't really do it yourself because it's very hard to care for when you're younger. And then as, a te as soon as I got to my teens, I got a chemical straightener. So my hair was straightened. I had never felt my tightly coiled hair in 30 years. And it was just my own sensory realization that I hadn't done that. And, you know, everyone knows there's, there is something sensual to the scalp, <laughs> like the touching of the scalp, there's, there's it, it, you're, you're touching your, your, your temple, you know, there's like a spiritual connection that happens when you touch your scalp. And the fact that I'd never really done that my entire life, it just took me down a, a rabbit hole to, of discovery. And then I realized if I was going to go and do a PhD, because at that time doing my PhD, I actually was working a completely different job. So I had to make a decision to become an academic. And I, if I realized if I was going to leave the life that I had been living, I'm going to have to study something that I have a personal connection to. Otherwise, I'm probably never going to finish <laughs> because a PhD is really hard. So that's the long about story to say that I did this work because it was personal. And that's what led me to the dissertation and then what led me to the book and why I'm still giving these talks 10 years later. All right. Thank you. Um, another question that came in is concerning the differences between the US and Canada, because I think a lot of what you just talked about was US history. And I feel like um, with the Black Lives Matter movement um, in the last couple of years, the United States and its problems with systemic racism have been in the media a lot and have been on a lot of people's minds in Europe as well. But I feel like Canada isn't as present in this whole discussion in Europe as the United States because the problems are overtly happening there mm -hmm. and on a big stage. Could yeah, you say I mean, something about that? Of course. I mean, it's the same. I mean, this presentation, if honestly, if I if I was if I was going to be asked to to also talk about Canada, I probably would have needed three hours. <laughs> and then we would have had to have a break in between <laughs> because our story is, is similar, 
it's some of the same stuff, but then there's a point where it does depart a little bit. And the reason you don't hear a lot about Canada, I think internationally, is because there's always an assumption that there's no, there are no black people in Canada, that there isn't, that we don't have a story to tell. And I think part of that has been the lack of, um, let's just, I'll give you an example. I actually know a lot more about uh, 10 years ago, I actually started to read the work of this particular scholar. I can't remember her name, but she was writing about being like black. She was actually writing about being black and living in Germany. And she's talking about like black German identity and all this stuff. And I thought to myself, how come I'm reading this and I'm not reading a lot about black Canadian women's identities. So part of this is that we haven't done enough producing ourselves. The reason you know so much about the African-American story is because they have a, a pretty well-oiled cultural production machine think about the movies if you if there's a black movie that comes to germany i bet you it's an african-american movie right it like so the the entire world knows the african-american story it doesn't mean that our story doesn't exist it's just that we are just at the beginning of producing it so people like me there's other scholars in canada who are now just doing that work to tell the black canadian story because it is similar but it, it's it's it has its own unique, um, I would say the Black Canadian story is actually very similar to the Black British story. Like we have more in common with Black British people than even African Americans, only because the Black British population tend to be like the Black Canadian population from the Caribbean or continental Africa. And they landed up in Britain through immigration in the, in the 20th century. In Canada, we have a lot of that, but then we also have almost an indigenous population who have been in Canada for 10 generations that most people don't know about. There are Black Canadians who have been in Canada since the 17th century. Okay, thank you. Um, at the end of the talk, you said one of the things that we need to do is keep the conversation going until everyone can agree on at least the points of discussion. Um, but one of the things that really can help this conversation, I feel like, is uh, social media. And within the last couple of years, there's been a huge growth in body positivity on social media, yeah. which, of course, is a good thing. But then on the other hand, social media is also notorious for perpetuating um, stereotypical or problematic yeah. body images. Do you think there's more harm than good or is social media a chance to really push this conversation into the realm of mainstream discussion? Yeah, I mean, I've thought about this myself because it's really tough because something can start off with really good intentions on social media, right? Like I think of um, Black Lives, hashtag Black Lives Matter, for example, right? Like really powerful. It got so many people to, ra it's a rallying cry, right? And then after a while, it's like it just becomes an aesthetic online. And then big corporations then suddenly now tag this on to their, their ad campaign to make you think that they're like really socially conscious and aware, but there's no real action behind it. They actually call it slacktivism, right? Um, there's a term that they give it because it's kind of like it's very easy to, to reshare a post or to attach a hashtag to something, it's much more difficult to actually be on the ground trying to create new supports for people. And I think that's kind of what I was trying to get at. You know, the 1960s civil rights movement, not the civil rights movement, correction, the Black Panther movement, which often gets maligned, the Black Panther movement was actually about supports, structure, you know, they had a whole system where they were creating a um, sort of a lunchtime um, lunch meals that they were giving to children. They were in the community. They were actually talking about creating like a social net that was from the community up. They weren't talking about, you know, integration or they weren't talking about um, sort of messaging. In the 21st century, I think the problem is one of the things that social media does is that it, it does make us lazy. You know, it's pretty easy to just reshare something and not actually it, think about what does that organization actually need? 
maybe they don't need you to reshare. Maybe they need you to donate <laughs> some money. And after you donate some money, maybe if you live in the same city, maybe they need you to come down and help them at the local chapter because they're trying to set up some things. So it's kind of getting ourselves out of the laziness that social media kind of perpetuates because it's very easy to hit a button and not really care, right? Yeah, and I think an important thing that you just mentioned is corporate power and, you know, industry um, giants aligning themselves with stuff like that. Um, I was wondering, because, because um, you know, greenwashing, femwashing, all those kinds of practices where big businesses, they try to hop on the bandwagon of movements or of, um, you know, social media trends. Um, I guess the same is true for blackwashing as well, right? Where yeah. businesses try to to sell their products, specifically catering to a group, but oftentimes at an up cost. Is that is that a big big factor of it as well? Yeah, and for me, it's like don't do that. Just hire black people. <laughs> like so, what I'm saying to you is that if you really wanted to enact change then you would start to change the structure of things, not the appearances of things. So for example, if you are a company and you're like, I'm really concerned, I really wanna do more for social justice. And then your entire company is basically, you've only employed white employees. That's actually where you wanna start. And then after you start there, it's thinking about, well, what positions of, of um, leadership it's not about the ground floor, right? It's like, look around at your leadership team and see what they look like. Because the truth is in the 21st century, if you really stand by social justice and wanting change, then you actually then wanna be in dialogue with people who are decision makers. Because if you're not a decision maker, it's actually just window dressing. But is there a way for us as the customers, especially like people like me who are white European male to use our buying power to help in any way? Yeah, it means being a lot more discerning about where you shop and what you do. It's like, for example, and I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone, but I've never been on Spotify. I do not plan to join Spotify. I have zero interest in Spotify. That's just a decision that I've made. Whereas a lot of people feel like they can't leave, they can't leave brands. <laughs> you know, they're they're just like, oh, I could never. I, yes, you can. If that brand is not giving you what you want or what you think you need in terms of equity, inclusion, and and community, then you can absolutely put your money elsewhere. And in fact, given COVID increasingly put your money in a local business that can probably really need it right and i think that to me is the is the actual political thing you can do as opposed to just resharing a post on your page support a black business in your community i'm sure they exist across every country in europe probably has one black entrepreneur <laughs> that is doing business look search them out and support them Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in, um, black people often have to deal with discrimination based on their hairstyles. Do you think if the Crown Act gets passed on the federal level in the United States, that that could result in drastic changes? Yes, I do. Because if you understand U US politics, how it works, state laws, you know, federal trumps state. And once you get a state law, that means everywhere you live, anybody who lives in any state, those laws apply. And I think, and that's why it's so difficult in America for federal laws like that to pass, because the states are always going to claim states' rights and, and, and we don't really support that and X, Y, and Z. But yes, I do think if it's passed, it will be a big precedent and it will have a ripple effect in other places around the world. Canada, for example, does not have any such protection. Could you give a brief outline of what the Crown Act Yes. Well, it's essentially, you know, saying that a, a person of African descent can't be discriminated against based on their hair. So you can't be fired. 
you can't be um, held back in promotion, all the things that happen that have happened over the time. So for example, um, as it stands now, I think it's maybe about five or six states. There's only about five or six states in the United States that actually have state laws that say you can't discriminate against a person because of a hairstyle. That means in all the other states, 45 others, whatever it is, you can be fired because an employer deems your hairstyle to be unprofessional, inappropriate, or they just don't like it. They can overtly tell you that's the reason you're not getting a job and you, can, you don't really have a claim against them. So this kind of act will basically make hair discrimination illegal. Which in itself is unbelievable that that's not <laughs> like... Why is this not state level but it legislature goes back, yet? But it goes back to what I'm saying, the dichotomy that I was setting up from transatlantic slavery, that natural black hairstyles are still deemed political. And I think it's because it's in the ether that they signal, they signal something. Like if I corn roll my hair, even if you didn't know that story about it being the map of the plantation, you might think that it meant something anyway, right? And you might be just a little like, well, what is that hairstyle about? You might just question it. And for a lot of people, they don't even want to have to question it. They just already see it as threatening. And of course, there's also the narrative of what's professional. And what's professional, like even if you were to Google, like go on Google images and just like Google professional, <laughs> professional work attire or something like that, you would probably see someone with straight long hair, professional woman, straight long hair, and she's probably going to be white. So it's in all of our mindsets that that's professional. If your hair is not long and straight, um, you're, you just don't belong at the company. And for ever in America and elsewhere, because in Canada, there's been cases too of hair discrimination where Black women were fired from their job or told to go home because their hair, in each case, it was because their hair could not be styled in a way that matched the other women that worked at this place of business. So they were told that they couldn't return to the job. Yeah, it feels surreal thinking about that. But then again, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, in Germany, there's a big debate currently going on about um, the church and its hiring policies because the church in Germany has a very special relationship or they have their own legislature when it comes to um, hiring practices. And so they currently can do similarly to um, businesses in the US can let people go for their hairstyle church in Germany is the only institution that I know of that can discriminate against people who are non-binary non -binary or uh, non-hetero. Um, so there's a similar conversation happening at the moment about that, which feels equally surreal in the 21st century. <laughs> it it um, does, but you know, the past and the present is a really funny thing because uh, everybody has their own timeline. Like we think there's a main timeline that we're all kind of navigating around. No, it's just like concurrent timelines that everybody's living on. And so my work, what I'm trying to do is to get refocus people onto a timeline that is like, here's the timeline. Okay. Like, let's try to navigate toward this timeline and have just more of a depth of understanding of the experiences of people of African descent when it comes to our hair because it's not just a hairstyle, it's deeply embedded into the fabric of how we've experienced this world. The Western world has been experienced by black people through a prism that has literally said, everything about you needs to change. You need, going back to the first slide, the minute you landed in this place, you had to actually change. So we were forced into a, like adapting Right. We, we just culturally black people have been forced are an adaptive people because we were forced into doing being that way for generations. And so now in the 21st century, with all the freedoms that we enjoy otherwise, it's just really hard to imagine that we're still being asked to adapt to something. You know, it's 
it feels very archaic, but it's just how it is in many places. Okay, thank you. Maybe to end on a little bit of a hopeful note, <laughs> what is what are your hopes for black beauty industry, the black beauty culture? Where do you want to see us in 10, 20, 50 years? Yeah, I mean, I having said everything I just said over the last like hour and a half, I'm actually still very hopeful because I know at a lot of even in the L'Oreal's of the world, there are actually a lot of people in those corporations who are looking to make change, who are being more cognizant of what 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 kinds of chemicals are we actually putting into these products? How do we communicate with communities? But at the end of the day, I actually believe the, the aim of the 21st century is for the individual to raise their consciousness and awareness about where they buy their products, who they buy their products from. It's like the conversation we were having before this about, about um, sort of like green energy. It's like, think about the world's, consciousness since 1972, I think was the first um, global meeting on the environment. And maybe it was 71. I can't even remember. People now, everybody knows that they have to recycle, <laughs> you know, like we all have in our consciousness and awareness of the environment, beauty culture. And what I've said today, it's the same thing. We're just at the beginning of people having that conscious awareness and it takes time. I mean, you know, we could end, you know, I'm sort of ending on a positive note, but I'm also realistic that global consciousness um, takes time. It 20 years, 30 years, it's not going to happen overnight. But what I know is that since I started this journey with this topic in 2009, it's already changed. Like there's a huge changes since 2009, but we're still in the beginning of it. We're not at the end. So there's just more work to be done. So what's the good, what's the good ending is to keep doing the work and to keep asking questions and to keep having an awareness that you don't know everything. It's impossible to know everything. And, you know, and also for people like me who are of African descent to share our stories to come out of the closet, so to speak, and talk about the things that we're living through. Because if we don't talk about it, then how, then how do we expect people to change? You know, it's, it's kind of like, people are not just going to change because you show up, you have to tell them who you are. And then you have to love who you are first, then tell them who you are, and then demand that they treat you the way you want to be treated. None of that's going to happen if people just stay silent and say that they don't want to you know, they don't want to be embarrassed or whatever it is. So it's all about raising the consciousness. And I think events like this, it's like one small nugget of doing that, right? It's like one step toward doing that. And I think that's the hope for the future, that we can still have these conversations generation after generation until we don't need them anymore. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being here, for sharing your insight with us and for keeping the conversation going. Um, thank you also, everyone at home who joined us tonight. I hope you will continue to keep the conversation going with us as well. Maybe next week, maybe next month, but do keep coming back and keep talking to us about these important issues. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.